I answer, there is not the like reason, for God and nature have given to the strongest a just and authority over oppressors to repel unjust violence with innocent violence. But that we should force the true religion on idolaters, we have not. We should for uh, we have not the like ground, excuse me, except they did attempt to obtrude their false ways upon us and injure our souls. For there is a vast difference between a people never receiving the true religion and a people who have embraced and submitted to laws that have enacted the profession of the true religion. Those that never profess the true religion cannot be compelled to receive by the sword of another nation, except they first subdue them in a just war and be masters of them, and they may educate the posterity of the subdued people, and discharge the duty of parents to them, and impose laws on themselves to cast away the idols of their father's house, and to learn the knowledge of the true God. But they cannot make the not receiving of the true religion the ground of a war, for we read not of any such cause of war in the scripture. It is true, God did command his people to destroy the Canaanites, but idolatry was not the quarrel. Joshua eleven nineteen. There was not a nation that made peace with the children of Israel, save the Hittites, the inhabitants of Gibeon. All other they took in battle. Verse 20. For it was of the Lord to harden their heart, that they should come against Israel in battle, that he might destroy them utterly, and that they might have no favor, but that he might destroy them as the Lord commanded Moses. And those that they subdued in the wilderness denied them harmless passage through their land. It is true, some popish writers as Massius, Cornelius, uh, Lapid, Abulensis, Abulensis, excuse me, say, if the Canaanites would have sought peace and embraced the worship of the true God, the Israelites would not have destroyed them. But the text, Calvin and famous papists as Cajentinus, Suarez, Gamachius, and Augustine before them, say plainly, Israel made war against them, and Israel but defended themselves against the Canaanites. Libertines say the teaching of the gospel, Matthew 28, and not the sword, is a means to spreading the gospel. So say we, I see no warrant we have to obtrude the gospel and the purity thereof upon papists in France and Ireland, but we may lawfully avenge the blood of the people of God on Irish murderers who exercise extreme cruelty and tyranny over persons and the consciences of the martyrs and the oppressed people of God amongst the papists. The question seems harder when these of a false religion, in regard of their nearness and vicinity, to a kingdom professing the true religion, when as they may infect them, or if they be in one national covenant, and under the oath of God, to endeavor the extirpation of all false religions, and what is contrary to sound doctrine. It is certain, the kingdom of Judah might justly have avenged the apostasy of the, tw of the ten tribes from David's house, and from Jerusalem, where the Lord had set his name, for the worshipping of the golden calves. If the Lord by his prophet had not expressly forbidden them to fight against their brethren, 1 Kings 12, and the children of Israel did justly attempt war against the two tribes and the half, because they erected a new altar for worship, as they conceived, which was apostasy from the covenant of God and the true religion, which they were to maintain by the oath of Joshua in Joshua 22, verses 12, 13, 15, and 16, and to bring the wrath of God on all the tribes as Achan did in verse 20, no doubt, saith Calvin on the place, they were angry with an holy zeal. For saith he on verse 12, The sword is not given to every man in his hand, but every one according to his calling ought, by this place, manifestly and constantly to defend the true religion. And if the wrath of God come on all the people, saith Calvin, for the secret sin of one man, much more the people shall not go unpunished if they dissemble the manifest idolatry of many. Piscator saith, it was piety in the tribes that they resolved to make war with the two tribes and the half, for their defection from the true God. Such was their zeal, say the divines of England, that they would rather hazard their lives than suffer God's true religion to be corrupted. For God had ordained there should be but one place for public service and sacrifices, and but one altar. Leviticus 17, verses 8 and 9. Deuteronomy 12, verses 5, 7, 13, and 27. Exodus 20, verse 24. Deuteronomy 27, verse 5. For they were all in covenant with one God, and this was a schism and an apostasy from the church, saith Diodat, in which alone is the true service of God and the participation of his grace and covenant. So also the Geneva Notes approves the lawfulness of the war and the Dutch annotations. To this accord also, popish writers on the place as Vitabulus, Cajentinus, 
Cornelius a Lapide, who command this zeal, and say all the twelve tribes made but on state and one church. And Tostatus saith, there was a necessity of making war with the two tribes because the law commanded it. Deuteronomy 13. Therefore they took not counsel whether they should make war, but they consulted touching the matter. So agreeeth Hugo Cardinalis, so Macius, so Serarius. Lyra saith, We should not be undertaken, but upon a certain and just cause, especially against friends. Therefore they send messengers to the two tribes, to try the cause of the new altar. Menochius, out of zeal, they sent messengers to try the crime of idolatry and to bring them to repentance, if not to make destructive war against them. And Ferris, they were ready, if the two tribes obeyed not, Armus the Cerner, to decide the matter by war. Would God, saith he, there were such zeal in us, and we see not one altar erected, but a number of superstitious altars. From this place it is clear, when a kingdom or two kingdoms are united together, and confederate by the oath of God in one religious covenant, they become an ecclesiastic body, so as the whole may challenge any part that maketh affection, and labor to gain them. And if they contumaciously resist, they are with the sword to decide the matter, lest wrath from the Lord break out on the whole confederate body. As for the sin of one Achan, wrath came upon all Israel. Now can I well see what can be answered to the uh, what can be answered on the contrary, excuse me, except that war for the new altar was undertaken upon judicial and temporary warrants, which do not bind us under the New Testament. But this is said, not proved, that new altar was not a heap of stones. But if it had been made upon righteous grounds, and for the service of God, it had been no less than an apostasy from the true religion once delivered by God, than if the third part of Scotland or England should turn apostates from the religion once sworn, after they had bound themselves in covenant, the question remaineth, what should the state and parliament do in that case? Should they be indifferent, the holders, and not use the sword against such apostates? Suarez and others, not without reason, thinks that infidels that are not subjects and not apostates cannot be compelled to embrace the true faith, even though to be sufficiently proposed to them. His reasons are, there is no lawful power given to the church by Jesus Christ to compel such. Secondly, it is no tradition of the church. Thirdly, those that are without cannot be judged. But the truth is, the sword is not given to the church as the church, and in the spreading of the gospel. The Lord forbids the use of the sword. It is true, a Christian prince may deny to infidels liberty to dwell in his bounds. See Weems, Volume 3, Exposition of the Judicial Law, Cap. 15. And subjects may be compelled not to blaspheme Christ, nor to dishonor the true God, with manifestly professed impieties. For if Asa made a law, Second Chronicles 15, that they that would not seek the true God should be put to death, if that be temporary and Judaical, then the Christian magistrate is not a Christian magistrate, or as a nurse father, Isaiah 49.23, so much as to command any to serve Christ, nor to rebuke any for blasphemies. Sure, this can be no part of the peaceableness of Christ's kingdom, not to rebuke sinners, but nurse fathers and civil tutors must do something for the defense of the truth from errors. For Constantine... The great close for Constantine the Great, excuse me, closed the temples of heathen gods, to the end that heathenish idolatry might be abolished, as Eusebius saith. See also Rusinus, Iovanius, and Nesiphorus, and Justantina made many laws against idolaters before Constantine the Great would pardon Arius. Hakon Epe, Fagan, Ha, De, Kai, Tuto, Sof, Comente, Epoye. He exacted an oath of him that he should stand to the Nicaean faith, and he swear but dissembleth. So Socrates, then Arius, was punishable by the emperor. So Timotheus Colon, bishop of Constantinople, under Anastheus, first emperor, was an Eutychian, and cursed such as rejected the synod of Chalcedon, 
and before the emperor cursed such as approved the synod of Chalcedon. So Theod Anagnostes, Petrus Mongus, Bishop of Alexandris under Zanon, the emperor, was an Eutychian, then again Orthodox. A little after he rejected the council of Chalcedon, a little after, in an epistle to Achaius, bishop of Alexandria, he professed the sound faith and denied that he rejected the council of Chalcedon. Again, he rejects that council and the sound faith. Therefore, Evangrius tells him, Kathuron, Kathuronon, Kai, Palimbalon, Kai, Tois, Kapois, Sudate, uh, Sude Tse Menon, a shoe for every foot, a turncoat, and a time server. Ergo, such heretics, besides that they have not been innocent and godly, as Arminians say, they feared the sword of the magistrate. But as touching the practice of emperors and the imperial law, imperial laws, excuse me, for ratifying church constitutions, there be but too many of them, as also for gathering councils which proveth the coactive power of princes, kings, and emperors over heretics and seducing teachers.